Our merciful God, maker of us all, pleads the cause of the poor and afflicted. Open our hearts to demonstrate God's grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Come, let us worship God. <laughs> Many people brought their greatest needs to Jesus, certain he would help them. And with that same confidence, let us confess our failings and seek forgiveness. Please join me in our unison prayer of confession. Almighty and compassionate God, every day in our desire to attain our wants, avoid discomfort and shun those who do not know or love. We show ourselves to be unworthy of your gifts of life. Of this we are solely aware. When we ask your power to renew us in body and spirit, that we will be able, through your help, to walk in the way you intend for us. Forgive us and lead us in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Just as Jesus made the deaf to hear and the mute to speak, our merciful God lifts our burdens from us, removes the failures of our past, and turns us to new life. You are forgiven. Walk in peace. Let us pass the peace. Our God has bestowed us with favor and honor 
through Christ, who has given us the words of eternal life. From this fullness, let us now offer our gifts of thanksgiving in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Will the ushers please come forward?
marches. Yes, I know he watches. I know he watches over me. Let us pray. Receive our thanks, O God, for your gifts of life, means, and time. We treasure your offerings, and small as our return giving may be, welcome it for the sake of those in need and for the furtherance of your witness in this world. Make us daily more grateful for all we have been given. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. Our first reading today is from the book of James, chapter 2, verses 1, or verses 1 through 17. Hear now the word of our Lord. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet, have you then not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into the court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over just judgment. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of them says to them, or you say to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? 
So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy God, whose spirit comes to us in moments of both strength and weakness, come now into our midst that we might be able to hear your word in fullness and in truth through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning is from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 7, verses 24 through 37. Hear now the gospel of our Lord. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment and they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. In college, I had a friend named Andrea. We both played clarinet, and we often played duets. Andrea leaned on me through some extremely difficult things that happened to her during the time I knew her, and I was happy to be there for her. We have lost touch over the many years since we last played together in the same studio, but I do hope 
that Andrea remembers me fondly once in a while. I certainly have not forgotten her. I love giving gifts. Always have, likely always will. My eyes are perpetually keen when it comes to looking for things that my loved ones might need or enjoy. So when I saw a really cool teapot at the Goodwill in the autumn of 2008, I immediately thought of my tea-loving friend, Andrea. Imagine my delight when I saw the price tag. Two bucks. What a find. I called Andrea up and we set a tea time for the following afternoon before rehearsal. Her reaction to my little present was just as I had expected. She loved it. Big smile, her eyes lit up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I was not prepared for what came next though. Instead of making tea with the teapot, she carried it over to a little decorative shelf in the living room and perched it among some framed photos. Perfect, it looks great there. I frowned a little. Aren't we going to use it? Andrea furrowed her brow. Well, maybe for a special occasion, but today is just regular tea. The pair of us continued to meet up for tea after that for about two years until she moved away. Never once did we use that really cool teapot from the Goodwill. So why do I care about an item I purchased for $2 from a thrift store in my early 20s? Why do I even remember this? Y'all know me by now. I have an analogy in mind. The teapot for Andrea was a gift given by me. Faith is also a gift given by God. The Lord grants us this beautiful gift of faith so that we may enjoy the ultimate gift, everlasting life, salvation for our souls. The enormity of such a precious and costly gift is mind boggling. Jesus paid with his very life for this gift. This is my body, broken for you. This is my blood, poured out for you. The incalculable value of this gift from God is difficult to fathom. So how do we respond to such a gift? Look at the way we treat the valuable things of this material world the things that represent earthly ways of thinking. The Hope Diamond sparkles from behind glass at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., heavily protected. Can I touch the diamond? No. Can I hold it in my hand? Absolutely not. My granddad owned a 1957 Chevy Bel Air with the tail fins. It was marketed as a family car. Many folks of that era used them as daily drivers. Not my granddad, though. The 57 was special. We don't drive it in the rain. We don't drive it in the highway. We really don't drive it much at all. This car, my family still has it, manufactured in 1957, still has the original tires on it to this day. And it spent most of its existence inside a dark garage. Andrea was so sweet to esteem that silly $2 teapot so highly because of our friendship, but it always bothered me, still does, that it just sits on a shelf. As Christians, faith is truly our most valuable asset. So let's put it behind glass, right? Keep it carefully shielded, secure, and separate from the unwashed masses. Let's keep it parked safely in the garage, protected from any dings or dents. Let's set it up on a shelf and gaze at it fondly once in a while. Oh, how nice, how lovely it is to have faith. Save it for special occasions. Hmm, nope, 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 nope. 
all the nope on all of that. I don't think any of those options could be further from correct on how we treat the gift of faith. Have you ever heard a home described as lived in? There are signs of wear and tear, a burn mark on the countertop from when your daughter baked her first cake and got so excited to take it out of the oven that she forgot about putting down a pot holder first. There's a dented spot on the back of the recliner where the cat takes his daily afternoon naps. <laughs> Maybe nobody bothers folding the afghan on the couch that Auntie crocheted for us. There's no point because the minute they neaten it up, somebody is using it again. Think of a place where you're not afraid to put your feet up and have a good laugh. This is the kind of home that faith needs in our lives. Our faith needs to make a mark in this world, on our lives, on the lives of those around us, to the very ends of the earth. But that line from James, faith without works is dead, can easily be taken the wrong way, can it? We get the idea that unless we are do, do, doing, go, go, going all the time, we must be falling short. What must we do to receive salvation? The modern way of life seems to have every waking moment occupied with something. When it comes to that Martha the doer versus Mary the listener question, society inevitably pushes us toward the Martha approach. So we load up our schedules, we take on too much, and we end up with very little breathing room left for our spiritual lives. This is not the result James was going for when he wrote that faith without works is dead. So what does James want from us? More importantly, what does God want from us? What does it mean to have a living faith? Well, it might help if we consider whether our faith is active or passive, awake or asleep. Let's unpack that. What we don't want is passive, dormant faith. So let's take a look at what that might mean. Passive faith is like the Hope Diamond behind the glass, the 57 Chevy in the garage, the teapot gathering dust, on a decorative shelf. These things are guarded, separate from the workings of everyday life, kept apart, protected, reserved. These are things that we leave behind for safekeeping when we venture out into the world. As impressive as these showroom items may be, even when we consider their sentimental value, they don't really make much of a difference in our lives or the lives of those around us. If we drop our faith off at the church door until next Sunday when we depart from worship, if we tuck it away at home when we go off to work, we find ourselves unprepared to actually use it. What special occasion are we saving it for? Christmas? Easter? There is no need for partiality concerning when or where we apply our faith. The fruits of the Spirit create a universally beautiful sauce. It's good on everything. Yay. Sprinkle that goodness all over. Consider my little pocket knife here. I take this thing with me wherever I go. It's always, always on my person. Why? So I can use it. When Sherry needed to trim the candle butt down to fit in our holder, my pocket knife was ready to help. When we needed to crack open a brand new box of hymnals, boom, pocket knife. The guys needed to pry open the toilet paper dispenser in the ladies' room to refill it, you guessed it, pocket knife. This little bit of metal is a great analogy for what it means to have an active, awake faith. Not only do I carry it with me at all times, I am always looking and listening for opportunities to use it. I'm proud of it. I like to share it. 
I'm happy to let others see it, hold it, use it. To know that I have it available for any and all purposes that may arise brings me comfort. An act of faith does not have to mean that we're signed up for every church activity or volunteer opportunity that's available. To be awake and aware does not require us to have every hour planned and scheduled. We just need to be ready in all that we do. A living faith is one that we weave into the fabric of our everyday lives, carrying it everywhere with us. We all have lives and communities outside of this one that we share as a church family, and God calls us to respond to the people and needs around us in faith. What Jesus said to the Syrophoenician woman reveals a beautiful truth. When Jesus implied that healing would be only for his people, the Jews, he was testing the woman whose daughter had a demon. Her correct answer about the crumbs falling from the table gives us insight into how God's kingdom spreads through our physical reality. Faith is not just for us, the family of God. When we respond boldly in faith to the world around us, we see a trickle-down effect, like those crumbs falling from the children's table. Allowing our faith to be an open door affords us the opportunity to touch the lives of those around us. This is how evangelism happens organically. People learn about faith through witnessing ours. It's contagious in that way. In my opinion, it's pretty hard to know about something you haven't experienced firsthand. And if we keep our faith to ourselves, that's what happens. Nobody knows about the light if we keep it under a bushel. How would we ever know what the flavor of salt is like if we never have the opportunity to taste it? When Jesus walked the earth, many did not believe what he said, but they believed what he did. Hearing the word of God may not change someone's life, but what about seeing that word enacted? When we do what the Bible tells us, when we behave in a way that is in keeping with the Spirit of God, the people around us can't help but take notice. MRC is the children's table, and I have seen so many fruitful crumbs cascading down as we feast upon the bread of life together. I wanted to thank you, especially my friends, for how you welcomed my mom when she visited. There is religious trauma in her past, the kind where individuals and factions of her family have cherry-picked the scriptures and wielded them as weapons to fire at people they don't like, people they want to disparage and exclude. Sadly, the Bible can be torn apart and used to wound instead of heal, to condemn instead of save. Too many people like my mom have seen too much of that partiality and judgment that James warns us about in our lesson for this morning. My mom has not yet come to claim Christ as her Lord and Savior but because of you, she has been able to make some very big, very quick steps in that direction. In you, my MRC family, she sees that living, active, open door faith that our hurting world is so hungry for. Not only my mom, but all who visit here bear witness to the kind of faith that heals. Thank you for that. Keep this light of the world lit. Keep your salt of the earth salty. God gave us the gift of faith to be used, to be worn, to be lived in. Make it your daily driver. Pour from it. 
stay awake and alert, prepared to respond in faith to whatever comes our way. Amen. Please stand as you're able. We'll sing hymn 540. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Let us affirm our faith by reading together the words of the Apostles' Creed. Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Confident that God hears us and knows our needs, let us pray for all creation, saying, Hear us, O God, for your mercy is great. Gracious healer, you visit us when we are in pain and worry. You spread your hands on our wounds. You speak to demons. You bring peace and freedom. Visit your church in every land and for the well-being of all people of faith, make us one. Hear us, O God, for your mercy is great. Creator of beauty and surprising complexity, we long for the wisdom we need in order to cherish this earth. Give us the vision to see what you have made, vast expanses of prairie, forests dark and thick, oceans full of wondrous creatures, and the heavens bigger than our imaginations. Show us how to keep your gifts as good stewards. Hear us, O oh God, for your, your mercy, mercy is great. Liberator of the captive, 
You know the failings of the nations when we turn our friends and neighbors into enemies. Free our lands from despotic rulers, tricksters, people who lie for personal gain, and those who wield hate speech. Give courage and perseverance to those who are weary of these struggles for justice so that new life and strength will infuse their tired bones. Hear us, O oh God, for your mercy is great. Savior, we see the desperation of our sisters and brothers as well as ourselves. And knowing your love for what you have made, we beg your promises to be fulfilled waters in the desert, healing even in the time of death, protection from whatever is frightening, salvation for those who are without help. Hear us, O oh God, for your mercy is great. Holy God, we pray for those who grow our food and keep our water clean, for politicians who make good laws and judges who rule with compassion, for children, for elders, for parents and grandparents, aunts, uncles, and friends and strangers, give to your world the means to live in harmony. Hear us, O oh God, for, for your, your mercy, mercy is great. Is Almighty One, you heard the cry of the Syrophoenician woman and you answered her distress with a word. Say the word again today and relieve the suffering of your people. We pray especially for those with uh, specific needs today. Lord, we lift up Kenny and Cheryl, Michelle and Vivian, Kara Curry, Ira and Susie, Diane, Ron and Randall, Maddie, Sean, Andreas, Susan, Joanne, Jessica, Lily Lim, Acacia, Barbara, Todd, Emerson, Joe and Jeannie, Margie and Jean, Janet, Susan Garner, Dan and Joanne, Mike, Donna, and Lauren, Brandon, Rich and Katie, Shirley, Lisa, Ethan Zimmerman, Norman Kathy, and our sister church, Grace Point Church. Hear us, O oh God, for your mercy is great. For those who have helped us know you, we give thanks. Hear us, O oh God, for your mercy is great. Into your hands we place the welfare of all creation. In the name of the one whose life, death, Resurrection and ascension is our own life, Christ Jesus. And now through Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, let us say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Favored by the excellent name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, share your bread with the poor, advocate for the afflicted, show your faith in acts of kindness, Love your neighbor as yourself. We, we go, go in, in Jesus' name. name. May the God who made you, loved you, and lives with you bring you to a faith that cannot be weighted down and a courage that knows no bounds. <laughs>